Arrogance is one of the most destructive traits of humanity. Think about what arrogance does to a man. Arrogance eliminates a man's compassion. An arrogant man has no compassion for others. Arrogance is the disposition where a person thinks more highly of themselves than everybody else. An arrogant man is an unteachable man. They cannot be taught anything. Jesus in John chapter 5 says that it's arrogance that prevents people from believing in him. He says, you cannot believe in me because you receive honor from one another. The pursuit of honor from each other makes faith impossible. Andrew Murray says it this way. He says, pride renders faith impossible. He goes on to say this in his book, Humility. Humility is simply the disposition which prepares the soul for living on trust. And every, even the most secret breathing of pride and self-seeking, self-will, self-confidence, or self-exaltation is just the strengthening of that self which cannot enter the kingdom or possess the things of the kingdom because it refuses to allow God to be what he is and must be there, the all in all. You see, the more you think of yourself, the less you will depend on God. A man who thinks highly of himself does not need God to save his soul. Faith makes, um, pride makes faith impossible. If that's true, then arrogance is despicable. And one of the things that you've seen throughout human history is that arrogant men tend to rise to positions of power. And when they do, they're despotic in their rule. They're destructive in their kingdoms. This happens over and over and over again throughout human history. But I have good news for you today. A day is coming when all human pride will be eliminated forever. Listen to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2, 11 says this, the pride of mankind will be humbled and human loftiness will be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted on that day, for a day belonging to the Lord of armies is coming against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up. It will be humbled. There's a day coming when there will be no such thing as an arrogant man on the face of the earth. Can you imagine that? Every person dwells with his neighbor in humility. All pride will be humbled. All human loftiness will be brought low. We're going to begin to look at Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 8 today. And what Daniel sees in his vision is he sees a, a series of kingdoms. So we've been seeing these kingdoms his vision is going to focus particularly on the kings of these kingdoms and their arrogance. And what you're going to see over and over again is that every arrogant king has his days numbered. Every arrogant king will fall. Look at Daniel 8, beginning in verse 1. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that had appeared to me earlier. I saw the vision, and as I watched, I was in the fortress city of Susa in the province of Elam. I saw in the vision that I was beside the Ulai Canal. Now, a little side note that you won't notice as you're reading in your English Bible, we just now switched to Hebrew. You couldn't tell because it's a translation. But up through chapter 7, beginning in chapter 2 through chapter 7, essentially that entire portion was written in Aramaic. And it was written in Aramaic because it was for the nations. Aramaic was the lingua franca of the known world. And so those chapters were for everybody. Those visions that we saw in those chapters were for the entire world, were for the Gentile world. But chapter 1 and chapter 8 and on are specifically for the Jews. Now what's the difference? Well, chapter 2 through 7, we have the stories really of two kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And the message for the kingdoms of the world is repent like Nebuchadnezzar, not Belshazzar. Repent like Nebuchadnezzar, not Belshazzar. So the kings of the world are to see Nebuchadnezzar and recognize that God is able to humble the proud. And they're to see Belshazzar soiling himself 
and understand what God does to the arrogant kings who refuse to humble themselves. But chapter 8, we switch back to Hebrew. In chapter 8 through the end of the book of Daniel is a message specifically to God's chosen people. And it's a message of ultimate survival and intense persecution. Persecution is coming. Yeah, you're in captivity now. It's not over. The 70 years are coming to an end, but there is coming intense persecution, but you will be rescued. You can see here at the beginning of this chapter, it says in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, this would have been 551 BC. It says it was after the last vision. We saw that one in chapter seven. So this is building off of that vision. Now remember in that vision, he saw a series of four kingdoms and I argued that those four kingdoms coincided with the four kingdoms in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And I showed you what each of those kingdoms represented. Well, this vision is only going to coincide with two of those kingdoms, the middle two, the second and the third kingdom. He has a vision that's specifically about the Medo-Persian empire and then the empire that follows that, the Greek empire. The vision goes on. He says, I looked up and there was a ram standing beside the canal. He had two horns. The two horns were long. The one was longer than the other and the longer one came up last. I saw the ram charging to the west, the north and the south. No animal could stand against him and there was no rescue from his power. He did whatever he wanted and became great. Now, one of the blessings that we have in chapter eight is in the second half of the chapter, Gabriel appears to Daniel and tells him a little more explicitly than the messenger in chapter 7 what exactly the vision represents. So if you look down the page in verse 20, Gabriel tells him that this ram is the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. This ram is the Medo-Persian empire. And it's actually fitting that a ram would stand for the Medo-Persian empire because the Persian king, when he marched in front of his armies, would ca carry the golden head of a ram. You'll also notice the, the difference in the horn length. You see that? Well, the Medo-Persian Empire, when it was established, Cyrus established it. The Medes were the stronger empire, but he established the Persian Empire and caused it to rise to dominance. So eventually it was the more dominant. That's why he sees the second horn that rises up and is more dominant than the, than the other. Now notice the directions. You see the directions? He says, the ram charged to the west, the north, and the south. Now, this isn't a description of just spreading out over the whole globe, because then we would have four directions. There's only three directions. And interestingly, there's three primary military campaigns for the Medes and the Persians. And guess what directions they went? Yeah, the same way that God said they would go. In the north, they conquered Lydia in 546 BC. In the west, they conquered Babylon in 539 BC. We've talked about that a bit. And in the south, they conquered Egypt in 525 BC. Now, here's one of the things I want you to do. I'm going to go through a lot of history today. And the reason I'm going through a lot of history is because all of Daniel chapter 8 has already been fulfilled. So what's the point? What's the point of reading prophecy that has been fulfilled? Because you do well to pay attention to the prophetic word made sure. And one of the things that God's doing in chapter 8 is he's giving them, he's giving Daniel insight into near history so that when all of it's fulfilled in the next 400 years, the people looking down the annals of history see all of these things fulfilled. And now we looking back, we can see this is all fulfilled. So what does that tell us? The rest of Daniel is going to be fulfilled also. As a matter of fact, commentators who critique the book of Daniel and have an atheistic worldview refuse to date the book of Daniel accurately. So I just told you 551 BC is the date that he's referring to, the third year of Belshazzar's reign. They say that's impossible. This is too accurate for him to have said these things in 551 BC. And I heartily agree. This is way too accurate. This is way too accurate. And what, what's interesting is when you study the manuscript evidence, there's, there's the book of Daniel is replete with proof that it was written when Daniel said it was. It's not written later. It was not written after the events. The reason that it's accurate is because God is. 
And the message you're supposed to get from Daniel chapter 8 is that God is sovereign over all of these events. He lets Daniel know, this is my plan. This is what is going to happen, even down to the direction their military campaigns will advance. The passage goes on, verse 5. As I was observing, a male goat appeared coming from the west across the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. So he sees a goat, and if we look down the chapter to verse 21, Gabriel tells him that this is the first king of the Greek empire. And the first king of the Greek empire is a reference to Alexander the Great. He's the first king who goes out and conquers, and he expands the Greek empire. And this goat, he says, think about this description of this goat. It says, coming from the west. Where is Greece in relation to the Medo-Persian Empire? It's from the west. He says he comes across the surface of the entire earth. How extensive was Alexander the Great's military conquest? It was said to cover the entire earth. And it says that he came without touching the ground. This is a reference to the speed of his conquest. Well, part of Alexander the Great's genius um, is that he didn't operate according to the no normal battle season. They actually had seasons. There are seasons where you're supposed to go to war. And he broke all the rules. That he would show up and it's not the month for battles and he starts fighting people. They had no idea what to do with this guy. He, had, he was swift and intense in his military campaigns. Verse 6, he came toward the two-horned ram I'd see standing beside the canal and rushed at him with savage fury. I saw him approaching the ram and infuriated with him. He struck the ram, breaking his two horns, and the ram was not strong enough to stand against him. The goat threw him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. One, one of the attributes of the Greeks conquest of the Persians was their fury. They were furious. Why were they furious? Because of what the Medo-Persian empire had done to Athens, specifically the Persians had not just conquered Athens, but destroyed it and looted it. And actually Alexander the Great's father, Philip II, had stoked this intense hatred of the Medo-Persian empire in his people. And he died suddenly. That's why Alexander the Great became king at only 21 years of age. And when he died suddenly, the people were primed for a battle. And so Alexander the Great capitalized on that. His, his first major victory was at the Granicus River in Turkey. And at the Granicus River, he only had 37,000 men, while the Medo-Persian empire had 50,000. But as he was apt to do, he attacked them out of season. They weren't expecting the attack. He surprised them. He killed 4,000 of their troops. And on his side, actually he killed 5,000 of the troops. On his side, he only lost 400. And he continued to advance. Within three years after that very first military campaign, he had destroyed the entire Medo-Persian empire. His, his last battle with them was at Guagamela, which is just east of the ancient site of Nineveh. At that battle, Darius III was the king of the Medes and the Persians. He fled for his life. Alexander the Great captured him and put him to death. Verse 8 says, Then the male goat acted even more arrogantly. And when he became powerful, the large horn was broken. Four conspicuous horns came up in its place, pointing toward the four winds of heaven. Alexander the Great was only 25 years old when he conquered the Medo-Persian Empire. He went on after that. He was unstoppable after conquering the known world power. And, and because of his military prowess, because nobody could stand against him, because he accomplished whatever he set his mind to do, he began to think, I must be God. I must be God. He, he required people to worship him as God divine, and he sought to advance himself to be worshipped as a god. He died at 33 years old. 33 years old in Babylon, in a drunken stupor. Most, most commentators think that he died of alcohol poisoning. 
died in 323, and from 323 through 301, there was multiple wars and assassinations in order to gain the throne. In 301 BC, the empire was carved into four primary parts. I've mentioned this several times. I'm going to put them on the screen this time, though, so you can see them. So these are the four commanders that the, the Greece was divided between. Lysimachus took much of Asia Minor. Cassander took Macedonia and Greece. Seleucus took Syria and Babylonia. And Ptolemy took Egypt, the land of Judah, and Arabia. And we see those four kingdoms in verse 22. Chapter 8, 22, it says, The four horns that took the place of the broken horn represent four kingdoms. They will rise from that nation, but without its power. Now, the ones that you should be familiar with, especially for biblical history, are the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. Now, you can see there that Ptolemy took Egypt, the land of Judah, and Arabia. But what happened over the the next several decades is the Seleucids and the Ptolemies fought back and forth over Israel. If you don't understand, Israel is a land bridge. It is a strategic piece of real estate. And whoever controls Israel controls the trade routes between three major world continents. So you want to have Israel. You want to own Israel. And so they battled back and forth between it. So you need to remember those two because they're going to come to play later on. Verse 9, from one of them a little horn emerged and grew extensively towards the south and the east and toward the beautiful land. Okay, so from one of them, from one of these four horns. One of them emerged and it grew towards what? Towards the beautiful land. The beautiful land is the promised land. It's Israel. And what we see is eventually one of the Seleucid kings, Antiochus IV, in his military conquest was able to capture and hold on to Judah. And he began to rule over them. So we see from one of them, from one of these four, a little horn emerged and grows extensively. Now you might think, oh, little horn We saw a little horn in chapter 7. We did see a little horn in chapter 7. This is a different little horn, but there's a connection here. Chapter 7, the little horn came up later in the vision in a different empire, came out of the Roman Empire. This is coming out of the Greek Empire. But here's the similarity. They're both a little horn because this little horn, Antiochus IV, is a type of Antichrist. What we're supposed to see as we see Antiochus fulfilling the prophecies of chapter 8, we're supposed to be assured that the prophecies of chapter 7 will be fulfilled as well. As I trace for you the fulfillment of this prophecy in the life of Antiochus, what I want you to understand is that a worse Antichrist is coming. A worse, arrogant king is coming. And his end will be just as certain as Antiochus IV. So we see that he begins this intense persecution once he takes over the beautiful land. It says, It grew as high as the heavenly army, made some of the army and some of the stars fall to the earth and trampled them. Growing as high as the heavens. When we see that in Scripture, we we need to remember Babel. We need to remember the Tower of Babel. Man in his arrogance trying to exalt himself above his creator. And we see that Antiochus does the same thing. He grew as high as the heavenly army. Made some of the army and some of the stars fall to the earth and trampled them. Now some of the stars, what's he talking about right here? Gabriel explains that this is the holy people. These are the people of God. So when he says he made some of the stars fall to the earth, it's talking about the Jews, the chosen people being cast to the ground. You might remember when God speaks to Abraham, he says your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. They're referred to as stars here, and Gabriel interprets that for us. Antiochus began attacking the Jews, and and what's, what's interesting is that his persecution of the Jews really was advanced because of their reception to that persecution. What am I talking about? There, there was a, there was a group of Israelites who sought out Antiochus, and they said, you know what? We see how you Gentiles live, and we really like it. You seem to prosper. You have a lot of things that we don't. Um, We want your help to Hellenize our own people. 
We want our people to be like your people. We want our people to be Greek like your people. And so we're going to actually pay you to assassinate our high priest. So a group of Jews went to Antiochus IV and they paid him to assassinate Ananias III, their own high priest. And he did in 170 BC. He assassinated their high priest, but he didn't stop there. He went on to slaughter 80,000 Jews in Jerusalem, men, women, and children. He threw them to the earth and he trampled them. Verse 11, it acted arrogantly even against the prince of the heavenly army. It revoked his regular sacrifice and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. It acted arrogantly even against the prince of the heavenly army. See that? The prince of the heavenly army is referred to as the prince of princes later on in the chapter. This is God Almighty. Antiochus IV acted arrogantly against God Almighty. He wanted people to call him God Manifest. That's the name he chose for himself. And he actually had coins minted with that title on them. You can see one of those coins today. The inscription on this coin reads, King Antiochus, God Manifest, Bearer of Victory. God Manifest is Theos Epiphanes. This is why some, sometimes you'll see his name, Antiochus IV Epiphanes because that's the name he wanted for himself. He wanted people to see him as the manifestation of God on the earth. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, I'm God incarnate. I'm God in the flesh. That's blasphemy. That's what Antiochus sought to do. Now, he not only sought to exalt himself, but you might have seen in that verse that he made the regular sacrifices cease. He sought to cancel the worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem and eliminate all biblical faith. Look at verse 12 here. In the rebellion, the army was given up together with a regular sacrifice. The horn threw truth to the ground and was successful in what it did. The rebellion is most likely a reference to the rebellious Jews who began this monstrous persecution of their own people by going to Kim. They betrayed their own military. Their military was eliminated. And the regular sacrifice, the morning and evening sacrifices, was canceled. If Antiochus found a priest making a sacrifice to God, they were put to death. And and he didn't stop there. He made circumcision illegal. They were to remove the marks of circumcision, and they were not allowed to circumcise their little boys. If they did... He would murder the baby, hang it around his mother's neck, and then murder the mother. Then go find the father and whoever performed the circumcision and murder them as well. As a warning to others, no, you do not circumcise. You do not practice your religion. They were not allowed to keep the Sabbath. They were required to sacrifice swine on their altars. Anybody who was found with the law of Moses was put to death. And the law of Moses, wherever it was found, was burned. John Lennox explains the culmination of this this way. He says, This frenzied anti-God madness reached its height on the 25th day of the month, Chislev, corresponding to our December, in the year 167 BC. In a final act of supreme and studied blasphemy, Antiochus had the Jerusalem temple rededicated to the Greek Olympian god, Zeus dedicated the temple in Jerusalem to his God. He actually built an altar for Zeus over the altar in the temple, and then he sacrificed pigs on it, thus desecrating the temple in Jerusalem. Verses 13 and 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the speaker, How long will the events of this vision last? The regular sacrifice, the rebellion that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and of the army to be trampled. He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. There's this voice he hears and it's asking, how long will this be? And the reason the voice knows to ask that is because he knows that this outbreak of evil is going to be temporary. 
God never allows the arrogant to prosper forever. Their days are always numbered. And this time there's a really specific number, 2300. Now it's, it's interesting. It says 2300 evenings and mornings. And there's speculation about what that actually means. You might think, well, it's pretty simple. It's 2300 days and that's about six years. So this is probably about six years. This is going to last. Yep. Some people see it that way. Other people see it this way. They say this is 2,300 evening and morning sacrifices. So if you add up together all of the regular evening and morning sacrifices, there's 2,300, which should actually be about 1,150 days, which is about three years. And so you can read all sorts of commentaries and really good commentaries completely disagree on this and they try to make a really good case for it. Here's the thing. What we do know is the date the temple was rededicated. It was December 25th, Chislev, of 164 BC. So doing our math backwards from 164 BC, if we go back three years, we're at 167. What happened in 167? That's when the temple was dedicated to Zeus. The altar in the temple was desecrated. So the people who hold the three-year view, 1,150 days, 2,300 evening and morning sacrifices say, see, that's when it started. But the other people say, well, what happened in 170 BC? That's when Onias III was assassinated. No high priest. They can't keep their sacrificial system any longer without a high priest. That's when it started. Which one was it? I don't know, but here's what I do know. I know when it ended. And do you know that we still celebrate that today? That you still celebrate the end of Antiochus' dominance today? You see, in 164 B BC, the Maccabean revolution, they took back their temple, they reestablished worship, they cleansed the temple, and the legend says miraculously God allowed the oil that they had to last for eight days. And so they have an eight-day celebration. In John 10, 22, it's referred to as the Feast of Dedication. Jesus celebrated it, and Jews all over the world celebrate it today. It's called Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is exactly what Daniel is seeing is going to happen here after 2,300 days. What does it say? Then the sanctuary will be restored. See, here's what you need to understand. There's going to be evil people and imposters. And they're going to increase. And they're going to have power. And they're going to break out for a time. But every single one of them will fail. Every single one of them will fall. What I want to see you to see in this passage is that every arrogant king will fall. That's their end. That's their end. And if you don't remember that's their end, when you're under their reign, you will despair. You will lose hope. You'll begin to doubt. And so God assures Daniel, so Daniel can seal up the vision and send it down through the annals of history to us today and to every other people who's been able to read this and have hope in uncertain times. Because in uncertain times, there's one time we can be certain of this evil person will be judged. Their days are numbered. What I want to do today is I want to show you three lessons about arrogance in this passage. First one is that unopposed power results in arrogance. Unopposed power results in arrogance. Each of these kings who rises to power, rises to power without opposition. And because there is no opposition, they grow arrogant. Look at the passage. Look at Daniel 8, 4. I saw the ram charging to the west, the north, and the south. No animal could stand against him. And there was no rescue from his power. He did whatever he wanted and became great. This is the Medes and the Persians. Because they were unstoppable, they did what? Whatever they wanted. Look at the description here of Alexander the Great. He says, The goat, Alexander the Great, threw him, the ram, to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. You see that? There was no one to rescue the ram. No one could stop Alexander. What's the result? Look at the next verse. Because no one could stop him, the male goat acted even more arrogantly. You see, you see this arrogance over and over again in world leaders when they are not checked. 
when there's no system in place that checks their power. This is part of the genius of our founding fathers. They understood this principle. They understand men need to be checked. They understood what ultimate power does. They understood the corruption that it brings. You see the same thing happen with Antiochus. Daniel 8, 10 and 11. It says, it, referring to the horn, Antiochus, grew as high as the heavenly army. And look at verse 11. It acted arrogantly, even against the prince of the heavenly army. He grows high. He grows exalted. He cannot be stopped. He's winning his battles. What happens? Arrogance. Arrogance. Why? Because he grew as high as heaven. Every arrogant king will fall. Unopposed power results in arrogance. But the second lesson I want you to learn about arrogance from this passage is how they seize power. The arrogant sees power through lies. The arrogant sees power through lies. You see this particularly in Antiochus IV. What he does is he leads a campaign, what we would call nowadays a campaign of propaganda, where he seeks to eliminate all true worship of Yahweh in the land of Israel. Look at the passage. Look at verse 13. In the rebellion, the army was given up together with a regular sacrifice. The horn threw truth to the ground and was successful in what he did. He threw truth to the ground. You have God's word in your possession, you die. You do anything it says in God's word, you die. What do you do instead? You will practice my pagan cult. And if you don't, you die. He threw truth to the ground and was successful in what he did. A good historic record of the intertestamental period, the, the period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, is First and Second Maccabees. You go to First and Second Maccabees, and you can read about what happened historically between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. It's not part of Scripture, but it's a good historical record. And it says this in First Maccabees eleven forty one: the king sent letters. This is talking about Antiochus by messengers to Jerusalem and the towns of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and festivals, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and other unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane so that they would forget the law and change all the ordinances. He added, and whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. In such words, he wrote to his whole kingdom. He appointed inspectors over all the people and commanded the towns of Judah to offer sacrifice town by town. He didn't just issue edicts. You see what he did? He micromanaged. He made sure there was inspectors going out. Are you sacrificing swine? Are you doing what the king commands? If you don't, you die. I want you to understand this. He's doing this in Israel. He's outnumbered. How is he successful? The people complied. For a time. The people complied. And what's tragic about this story, I jumped in in 1 Maccabees chapter 1 and verse 41. If you go back a few verses, it all came about because of a rebellion in Israel. In 1 Maccabees 1.11, it says this, In those days certain renegades came out from Israel and misled many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles around us. For since we separated from them, many disasters have come upon us. This proposal pleased them, and some of the people eagerly went to the king who authorized them to observe the ordinances of the Gentiles. So they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the Gentile custom and removed the marks of circumcision and abandoned the holy covenant. They joined with the Gentiles' rule and sold themselves to do evil. Try to connect these first two principles. You see, arrogance is a result of unchecked power. His power was unchecked. Why? Because the Israelites complied. And not only complied, they actually paid him to murder their own high priest. 
They went along with it. Why? Because they thought those people out there, they have way more fun than we do. You see, they allowed the culture to dictate what their hearts needed. They looked at the world that surrounded them and they said, we want to be like the world. And we want to be like the world so much that we're willing to abandon all of our principles. And when the king begins to murder even 80,000, they continued to comply. Until one family had enough. That family was the Maccabees. Matthias Maccabee was a priest who had five sons. One of his sons, Judas Maccabee, led the Maccabean Revolution. His nickname was the Hammer. He was, he was not a WWF wrestler, but he still had a cool nickname. <laughs> See, every arrogant king will fall. Unopposed power, it results in arrogance. The arrogant sees power through lies. But for those lies to work, they have to be believed en masse. Last lesson I want you to see is all arrogance is temporary. Judas Maccabees gathered together men who came to him because they saw the despicable practices of Antiochus and they wanted to rebel against him. The rebellion was sparked by his father Matthias. Matthias was actually an old man and he saw one of the Jews in his town who was complying, who was sacrificing a swine on a pagan altar. And so he did what the law requires for a Jew. He put him to death. He was going to follow God's law. Because of that, it actually sparked a civil war in Israel. So before the Maccabean Revolution went against Antiochus, there was civil war. And they actually had to flee for their lives into the hills, and they began to gather around them a band of warriors. They used sort of ancient guerrilla tactics. And God gave them success. Eventually, they were able to throw off the chains of Antiochus. They were able to reestablish the temple for worship. You, you probably are curious about that or want to see a movie about that someday. Here's, here's what you need to know, not the details about how they did that. Here's what you need to know. How in the world were they able to do that? Because God said so. Because from the very beginning, Antiochus' days were literally numbered. And so they could have confidence. We're unstoppable because his number's up. Look at the passage. He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. What God says will always be done. It doesn't matter how powerful the man looks. It doesn't matter how arrogant he sounds. He will be cast down to the earth. God reigns. And God is reigning over human history even when it seems like the despots of human history are succeeding or advancing. It's not matter how mighty an earthly ruler might appear. He is nothing before his creator. Listen to Isaiah 40, 23. He, Yahweh, reduces princes to nothing and makes judges of the earth like a wasteland. They are barely planted, barely sown. Their stem hardly takes root in the ground when he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind carries them away like stubble. Barely planted. Think about Alexander the Great, 33 years old, conquered the known world, dies in a drunken stupor. Barely planted. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Look up and see. Who created these? He brings out the stars by number. He calls all of them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. The next time you are concerned about the evil rulers on the earth, get somewhere you can see stars. Not the Allen Valley. You've got too much light pollution. Somewhere you can actually see stars. Look up and worship. Your God calls those all by name. Do you know it's important? If we called every single star by name, there's not enough time in human history. If it just took one second for us to say each name. There's not enough time in human history. So many stars there are. He made them all. He created them all. He knows them all. God is in control of kings. God is in control of times. Listen to Isaiah 50, 46, 8. Remember this and be brave. Take it to heart, you transgressors. Remember what happened long ago. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and no one is like me. 
I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place and I will do all my will. I call a bird of prey from the east, a man for my purpose from a far country. Yes, I have spoken, so I will bring it about. I have planned it. I will also do it. He said it. He did it. That's what Daniel 8 is all about. What God said, he did. You know what that means? That means he can declare the end from the beginning. I want to close by reading Psalm 73 to you, and I want you just to meditate on these words. You can, I'm going to put them on the screen so you can read along if you want, but I want you just to focus on these words. Think about the psalmist and think about what it is that gives him support in uncertain times. Psalm 73, the psalm of Asaph. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray, for I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time until they die, and their bodies are well fed. They're not in trouble like others. They're not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out from fatness, and the imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock, and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore, his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Look at them, the wicked. They're always at ease and they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I am afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I had decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. When I tried to understand this, it seemed hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood their destiny. Indeed, you put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by terrors. What is it? that keeps the psalmist from verbalizing what would betray his people. It's the sanctuary. You see, when he looks at the world that surrounds him and he bases his evaluation of that world just on what he sees, it seems like the arrogant have it best. It seems like they're right. It seems like they're prospering. It seems like they're at ease. And he looks at himself trying to do what's right, cleansing his hands and living a life of purity. And what does he have? Persecution and hardship. And he would have failed. His foot would have slipped if he hadn't gone into the sanctuary. You see, it's when you go into the sanctuary, when you come into the place where God has made his name dwell, that you realize what truth is. That you recognize it's not what's temporary that we're living for, but what is eternal. It's there that you remember man is but a vapor. His days are numbered. It's in the sanctuary that he is reminded, but my question for you today is where is that sanctuary? Because there's times where I think that Psalm 73 describes me as well. I look at this world I look at the arrogant, I look at their prosperity and my foot almost slips. And so I too need to go into the sanctuary to be reminded of these things. There is a place where God has made his name dwell today. There is a temple on the earth and it's built up with living stones. Those living stones are you and me built into a holy edifice, the church of God that Christ is building, that the gates of hell cannot stand against. And that sanctuary is found when the people of God gather together as one. That's why we're here. Because we need this. If we don't have this, we forget what's true. If we don't have this, it seems like the world's winning. If we don't have this, we begin to believe the lie that the arrogant prosper and the humble are cast to the ground. But when we enter into fellowship with the saints, we are reminded 
of what is true. And that's my challenge to you today is I want you to make a commitment. I want you to make a commitment to regularly gathering with the people of God. I want you to make a commitment today to be back here next week and the week after that and the week after that and the week after that. I want you to put your life where your confession is. You say that you're a member of the body of Christ, but do you regularly gather with the body of Christ? I was sharing with the men on, on Tuesday night that there was a, a recent survey done where they distinguished between a nominal Christian and a committed Christian. Nominal, that word means in name only. A nominal Christian they defined as somebody who goes to church less than three times a month. A committed Christian goes more. Which one are you? Have you committed your way to the Lord? Is it seen in your life? Because it's here when we're assembled together that we're reminded that God uses the weak things to shame the strong. It's here that we're reminded to lift up our high eyes to the hills where our help comes from. It's here that we remember we have a king and he reigns forevermore. We need each other. We need to gather together. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being your people. Lord, that we can look to you and call you our God. Lord, help us to be faithful. Lord, we cannot be faithful in our own strength. It's easy, Lord, for us to get distracted by the world that surrounds us, to believe the lies that this world is trying to sell. And Lord, your truth cuts through those lies, pierces even to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a judge of the thoughts and intentions of our own heart. Lord, we need you and we need to speak the truth to each other in love. Help us, Lord to be faithful to your body, to your bride, to be allowing our lives to reflect our commitment to calling you our Lord and allowing you to be the Lord of our lives, of our time. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified as you build up your glorious bride upon this earth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.